talked a lot about this being a Jenga economy. And anything, the economy is now so fragile because of all of the Fed money printing and the global central bank money printing that any little piece that comes out could topple the whole thing. And we're coming up to a place where we've got a major thing that's about to happen. So I'm gonna take you down this rabbit hole that is intentionally made so complex. And I'll try and simplify it for you, but this is really important coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical, physical gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and dare I say it, thrive through the reset that I think it should be pretty obvious to everybody has already begun. And the other thing that I think should be pretty obvious to everybody is the fact that We've got central bankers and governments with their feet on the gas pedal and on the brakes at the same time. And that is creating a lot of volatility. And one thing we know, because we've talked about it over the years and the links to all the videos so you can understand it more closely is um, the derivative market and the shift between LIBOR, which is an interest rate benchmark that was created back in the 1980s and all contracts, mortgages, autos, credit cards, and also again, those derivative contracts have been written against. But when it was discovered back in 2012, that it was shocker, a manipulated rate that traders were using to manipulate for their own benefit, well, then we had to shift away from the LIBOR. In this country, we're shifting to the SOFR in the US, but there are several other benchmark rates out there. So first, you know, I know that this is, stuff is complicated, so let's just start with the basics. What is a derivative? Because this is what will be, this the flood and this next crisis in derivatives is going to be way too big for the central bank to wallpaper over. They're just not going to be able to do it. So what is a derivative? It is an arrangement or instrument like futures, options, warrants, but they're all contracts whose value is derived from the price action of whatever the underlying asset is. So it could be stocks, it could be bonds, it could be weather, it could be other derivative contracts, it could be credit quality, but it is derived from it and it is just a leveraged bet. Most derivative contracts are for speculation. So banks derive a lot of their income by trading these derivatives. They never intend to convert it into the underlying and frankly, they, in most cases, they cannot convert it into whatever that underlying is. It's just about trading revenues and it's about creating cheap leveraged bets. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is the CME group, which is a group a company that actually manages the derivatives, creates these derivative products and clears these derivative products. So the CME group, they're not the only ones, there's just a handful though, but they're right in the middle. And I'm just pulling up, um, you know, actual physical energy, silver and gold contracts. There are different size contracts, but the standard is a thousand barrels of oil, it's 145 bucks. And at the time that I pulled this data, 145 bucks controls over $85,000 worth of oil, barrels of oil. Well, in terms of barrels of oil, 5,000 silver ounces of silver. So 145 bucks controls over $90,000 worth of physical silver and a hundred 
troy ounces of gold or 164,000, almost 165,000. That's leverage. And as long as everything is working in their favor, the, the banks make a lot of money by doing this. Plus in 2013, after the derivative implosion in 2008, in 2013, they created some new accounting tricks called netting. And that makes what we see the notional value hide even more the true value at risk, VAR, value at risk. So nobody really knows how big this is, not even the guys that create it, manage it, determine whether or not it's a default, et cetera. They have no idea because this is a very, very, very opaque, complex, and convoluted market. However, knowing all of that, they decided what a good idea to integrate it throughout the entire financial system. What a good idea. As of June, 2022, according to the Bank for International Settlements, there are 600 trillion plus derivative derivatives, loans, securities, and mortgages that are all going to be impacted by this transition away from LIBOR and in this country into SOFR, but there's Sonia in Great Britain and Switzerland has its own, et cetera. And I've done a lot of videos on derivatives over the years, so follow those links to know a lot more. And the reason why we need to be talking about it now is because uh, in 2023, the transition is supposed to be complete. But fiat money products are created using derivatives. So, I mean, you know, what is it? A thousand ounces or 5,000 ounces of silver is pretty bulky and heavy. So much easier just to trade the contracts. But remember, if you don't hold it, you don't own it because it all runs counterparty risk. And, you know, I, I mean, we'll bring up so you can see all of the individual pieces in here, but this is in mortgages, this is in ETFs, this is in annuities. This is completely throughout every financial instrument. If you have any debt, you're going to be impacted because the value is going to change. I'll show you that in a minute. And if you hold any Wall Street products, ETFs, mutual funds, variable annuities, et cetera, even fixed rate annuities, they are all going to be impacted by this shift. And that's why it's so critical for you to be aware of it and for you to take steps to protect yourself. Because honest to goodness, th this is a big experiment. Never in history has this been attempted before, except they did attempt it back in 2000 and October, 2019, they kept talking about an $80 trillion test, an $80 trillion test. They ran it in October and then it went dead silent. And about three weeks later, they changed the, the drop dead deadline from 2021 to 2023. And I really do wonder if a lot of the volatility that we're experiencing today, a lot of the markets implosion, et cetera, if that isn't really a setup for this transition, because personally, and I could be wrong. I mean, this is, it's not like I have any insider information, I've just been paying attention, but I don't think they can do it. And I'm kind of sure that they know they can't do it. And so if the markets implode leading up to it, then that can cover or be another excuse for what's gonna happen in this grand experiment. The transition is supposed to be complete June of 2023. January of 2022, and you guys know, I've been saying that 2022 is a pivotal year, all year long. January of 2022, no new contracts could be written against using LIBOR, the interest rate benchmark of LIBOR in there. In the US, all of the contracts then had to be written with uh, SOFR in there because we're coming to the end. But just because those new contracts have been written with SOFR instead of LIBOR, what about all those contracts 
that were written prior to it. Let's take a look at what they've done to get ready for this transformation. Because the federal government has provided guidance for an orderly transition from LIBOR to SOFR without significant modifications, whatever that means. But I think I know, and I'll show you just in, in a few minutes. The current US dollar LIBOR publication is scheduled to end by June 30th, 2023. And, you know, I, I've also done uh, videos on how the banks and the other market participants in derivatives are not really crazy about the difference between the LIBOR and the SOFR. They're saying that the SOFR does not really uh, reflect the issues that we're dealing with and they don't really like it. So they were really forced to transition. It wasn't done willingly. But of course, all these other contracts are written for, for that. But they want to give the parties time to modify existing debt instruments, derivative contracts, and other contracts to replace references to existing LIBOR rates. Still not going to matter, and I'm going to show you why in a little bit. You got to stay with me on this one. But here's what our lovely government did. Without the safe harbor protection of the LIBOR regulations, such adjustments ordinarily could result in significant modifications, listen for this, for federal income tax purposes, I'm coming back to this, potentially resulting in realization of income, a deduction, a gain or a loss or other federal income tax consequences to the parties associated with such instruments and contracts. So what they're really saying in here is that they had to make it uh, this transition so that um, you have no recourse, you as an individual or you even as a collective group that that the value of all of these 600 plus contracts is going to change. Any contract that has LIBOR in it, when it shifts to so far, the value of that contract will change. So if you have a mortgage and it change, you may owe more money depending upon where that contract held. So I'm even talking about your 30 year fixed rate mortgages, which at least we have that in the US. But you have to understand that your mortgage payment could change and the principal value of what you own could change. Okay, so car loans, student loans, any kind of debt. A transition like this has never, ever, ever been tried before. And again, in 2019, they tried it with, with 80 trillion. It went dark. I couldn't find anything. And I'm a pretty good digger. And I really know, I mean, I keep at it and at it and at it. It just went dark. This is a very, very opaque market created by the banks, managed by the banks, determined about default by the banks, except that if this happens all at once, I don't think that they can manage that very well. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is going to be a big fat nothing burger. I don't think so though. I really don't think so. And I think that, that, that governments and central banks are trying to cover up what is about to happen. But there are these things called legacy contracts, which I'm going to show you in a second. And that is any contract that was created prior to the crisis, uh, the financial crisis in 2008, because these were unique contracts between two, maybe three entities. So there is no market for them and they have not died. Okay. They don't go away. These contracts don't go away. As long as you continuously pay the contract agreed upon cr contract price, it's out there floating. And we know that it was CDOs, collateralized debt obligation derivative contracts that imploded and created the crisis in 2009. Prior to that, it was in 98 long-term capital management. Legacy, so that's prior to 2008. Swaps mean 
all rate swap transactions, basis swaps, credit derivative transactions, forward rate transactions, interest rate swaps or options, forward foreign exchange transactions, cap transactions, floor transactions, caller transactions, currency swap transaction, cross currency rate swap transactions, currency options, spot contracts, or any other similar transactions or any combination of any of the foregoing entered into by existing SLM and in effect as of or before the effective time, including any of the foregoing entered into in connection with or by reference to any legacy indebtedness or securitization trust notes. Give me a break. I'm telling you, and they've actually even admitted this. They have made this stuff intentionally complicated and complex so that you do not question what they are doing. But hey, it almost took down the global system in 98. Did we learn from that? No. The derivative, the speculative derivative market grew substantially from there to 2008. That almost took down the global system and actually it did. That's when the system really died and it went on life support. So all, the only thing that's happened is that these issues have gotten bigger and a lot more integrated throughout the system. And that makes it a lot more dangerous. So the adjustable interest rate LIBOR, London Interbank Offer Rate Act, provides strong protection for legacy contracts, right? So these are all those unintended consequences that they're trying to plan for by telling you, bend over, you gotta take it, there's no choice. But without workable fallback provisions, in other words, all these legacy contracts never mentioned so far, actually even since then, most of them until 2018 never mentioned so far. They did not have that fallback language, okay? But the act also provides contract continuity and safe harbor provisions to shield parties, meaning banks, from liability under potential lawsuits due to the transition away from LIBOR. So we're making this transition. We're going to make sure that the banks that are too big to fail, they remain whole. Huh? Where have we seen that before? But even if ultimately unsuccessful, litigation could be disruptive for transactions with affected contracts, particularly from consumer loan class action lawsuits. Because all of your contracts will change in value, every single one. Let me show you because all contract values are going to be repriced. And by the way, this may not seem like that big a deal to you. And on maybe, you know, say a hundred dollar contract or a dollar contract, eh, maybe it's not that big a deal. But on over 600 trillion in notional value contracts, it's a very, very, very big deal. So here is the LIBOR interest rate, the one month, the three month, and the six month. Here is the term SOFR. Now, let me tell you the difference between the two. The LIBOR is a stated rate. So you have this small group of banks that get together in the morning and go, well, if I were going to loan you money overnight or for one month or three months or six months, this is what I think I would charge you. And if I were going to borrow money overnight or one month or three months or six months, this is how much I would be willing to pay. So these guys just sit around, have that discussion, and then that's the stated rate. So you can see easy, easy peasy to manipulate. Now, so far is supposed to be a market rate, right? But there are all, and I did this in, I don't know, like maybe one or two pieces back. So you definitely want to watch it all, watch all the videos and hopefully it'll help you understand this. 
but there are bonds that are actually not included in this. So honestly, it's not a really accurate market rate, but it is more of a market rate than LIBOR, which was an absolutely stated rate. So you can see that, let me grab my little laser pointer. Okay, so you can see the difference between the LIBOR and the SOFR in percentage interest rate, right? And it's a pretty good percentage as you can see. Now, what's coming up and the way that they're attempting to handle it, since these two rates are so different, is to take this term, the term SOFR and then what are they gonna do? They're gonna add a little spread. Certain percentage, based on one month, three months, six months. And then that balances it out a little more, but it's still different. And that is why every single contract will be repriced. Well, if every single contract is repriced and let's say JP Morgan's value is part of their value anyway, is based on these contracts that they hold and they have a whole bunch of trillions of dollars worth of contracts that they hold, now that little differential becomes huge. And it could mean an implosion for the stock market. So let's start it now. So people are kind of used to all this volatility. Maybe we can cover up what we're really doing and people won't know. But when you open up your statements, I'm pretty sure you're gonna notice because over $600 trillion in contracts are going to be affected. That's going to make a difference. Everybody may well see that the emperor has no clothes. Now, what could they do? They could grab their magic gate ball and say, okay, can we make this transition? Ask again later. So much for the magic eight ball. There's no way around this, honestly. But there was is one area that is more impacted. So it's the short term forward rate agreements. And they are over the counter, so OTC, so they're not as visible. Um, contracts between parties that determine the rate of interest to be paid on an agreed date in the future. That's what they are, okay? And the, you can see that the notional amount of that uh, has contracted sharply since the beginning of this year when they could no longer write these contracts against LIBOR. But my goodness gracious, we've known about this since here, I mean, the public has. Um, they've known about it since earlier than that. Now, when they knew that, they, that we were bringing in new benchmarks, did that change anything? Yeah, they just rushed into it more and stayed into it more he as heavily until they couldn't write those contracts in, time, in terms of LIBOR anymore. So now they're trying to get out of them, but let's see, where were we in 2008? Okay, now I'm wondering, this is what I'm wondering. Those legacy derivatives have been a danger. They have been black swans flying overhead without us really knowing when something may hit, okay? And I find it really interesting that we're now back to the 2008 level. They can't really get rid of those legacy derivative contracts. They can't. So I'm wondering if they just undid, but made lots and lots and lots of money in here and just got rid of all of those new contracts. Time is gonna tell, I can't really tell you the answer to that because it's hard for me to find out a whole lot of inner workings of the derivative market. But you know, you have to ask yourself this, do you think that this experiment 
is going to succeed because after all, if you look around at everything going on, you can certainly see how expert the central banks are, the bankers are, the government is. So, you know, I got to ask you, do you trust them? to pull off yet another experiment where winners and losers have been chosen. And guess what team you're on? You are not too big to fail. But those that they've chosen to win are, you see why this really pisses me off? Because people don't have any clue of what's happening. Look over here. Look over here. Misdirection, misdirection, misdirection. When what's really happening is an entire regime shift. And like I said earlier, it's like these guys have their foot on the gas and the foot on the brake at the same time. They know the chaos that that causes. Markets like certainty. And they're doing everything except giving them certainty. And that kind of started when they surprised them with that 75 basis point hike when they, and I mean the Fed, was promising the markets a 50 basis point hike. That may not seem like much, but when you're dealing with multi-trillions and even, dare I say it, quadrillions in the derivative area, that matters a lot. And what we're seeing is credit stress nearing critical zone. Well, gosh, most of these contracts are interest rate sensitive. There's got to be all sorts of bombs going off in this derivative area, but it's covered up by the bankers because they don't want you to know. Because if you really, really understood what was happening, you'd do the same thing that I'm doing, which is gold, physical gold, physical silver in my possession. I actually hold it at a vault because I'm too visible. But I can walk to that vault. And it's a private vault. It's not a bank vault. So just keep that in mind. If you really understood what was happening, then you would make sure that, you're, that you and your family and your loved ones were protected. And it's not just gold and silver. What we're talking about here is in the financial system. So this is the foundation. This is real money. But you also need food, water, energy, security, as well as that barter ability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. We need to share this information because ignorance does not make you immune. It just leaves you vulnerable. And I don't want anybody here to be vulnerable. And do you think that what stays here or what happens here stays here? No, no, no. It will transition globally. Now we're watching what's happening with England and England did this massive U-turn, right? So they undid all of the, the laws, the new budgets, everything, almost everything they've had to undo because the markets were falling apart and the government debt market was falling apart. We're also hearing about the lack of liquidity in the U.S. treasury market, which is the global foundation of the markets. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. If that's all you get, then I will be happy because you got to hold it and you got to own it. Everything else is counterparty risk. And that risk spreads because we are incestuously intertwined, not just in the financial system, but I did a video not that long ago on how we are globally intertwined, not just in the supply chain, imports, exports, every single area. The whole world has become one big gigantic financial product to be traded. Yeah, well, that's not you and me. We don't do that. It's for the other guys because after all, they are far more important than we are. But two G7 countries' financial market conditions have deteriorated so much that their central banks have been forced to intervene to stop the rot, stabilize prices, and restore order. G7, those are the top 
seven global economies. Two out of the top seven. That is what, two, four, six. That's, that's about 28%, 29%. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's really good. And Bank of England pivot to unlimited bond buying are linked by a common thread that poses growing risk to global financial stability. These are Japan and England are two of the top seven, part of the top seven economies in the world. And they both had to go in and intervene and then pivot. So why are the markets going up? Because that's the canary in the coal mine. And what the markets and the bankers and the Wall Street guys are seeing is that, yep, the central banks blinked. Yep, the governments blinked. So they're looking for the hyperinflation to go back to all the money printing again. Happy days are here. Let's drop those interest rates. Let's print that free money. Woohoo! But that's not good for you and me. And when you hear about the strong dollar and the impact that it has on the global markets, that's in relative terms. Because what do we know? We know that inflation erodes your purchasing power. And it doesn't matter how many of these that you have. It matters what you can convert them into. The Fed's relentless interest rate raising campaign and resulting worldwide surge in the dollar is tightening global financial conditions at an alarming pace. And every time they come out and they talk about it, they tell you they are not going to stop. They're not going to stop until something is very broken. Now, your attention is over here, your attention is over there, and what's really happening is this impossible, or probably impossible, because I can't guarantee one way or the other. It's way beyond my, you know, my control. But they don't want you to understand this because they don't want you to protect yourself. I want you to understand it so you can make educated choices that put your best interest first. Many feel this should put global financial leaders on the highest contagion alert, which market might succumb next to evaporating liquidity, for selling and gaping prices. Is the mighty U.S. Treasury market immune? Clearly, no, we are not immune. All markets, even the deepest and most liquid, can be challenged by a loss of confidence this is a con game and all con games require confidence and they've done a really great job but it's coming to an end and they know it and they're rushing if they don't already have the cbd set up they can talk like they don't but i don't know that i really believe that either you know I, i've been doing this work for so much of my life that, that, you know, you, you listen to what they say and then you watch what they do. And when their words are not congruent with their actions, you know, they're lying. When they are, you know, they're telling the truth. And the other thing is we are, the whole world is dealing with a lot of inflation and Interestingly enough, commodity derivatives, right? It's just a contract, it's just a big leverage bet. And commodity prices have actually been, you know, I think, <sighs> instrumental in pushing inflationary prices up. Do you think traders give a crap about you or me or the price of bread at the grocery store? Of course they do not. They only care about making their money. And the increase was driven mainly by derivatives on commodities other than precious metals, which I think is very interesting, Who's, which I don't think that's necessarily true, but okay, whose gross market value increased by 37% over the same period. And so we're talking about energy derivatives. And that really is, 
you know, we, we saw oil go to minus what, $37 a barrel? I'm gonna pay you to take my oil? Well, how in the world could that ever really happen? Derivative contracts, that's how. So whether it's going up and then it pushed oil up to what, 120 a barrel? I mean, these things are based on Wall Street products, not on a real supply and demand market. But that real supply and demand market, this is where you and I live our lives. We have to go and buy that gallon of gas or that gallon of milk. You know, we have to do that. But traders, they don't really give a crap. And so I'll put my neck out on the line here because I think that this is true. That derivative trading in all of the areas that matter the most to us I think that derivatives are driving inflation up. So what the Fed is doing, is that really gonna change anything by raising interest rates? What they're doing is killing demand, even though they openly admit that that doesn't tackle a lot of the inflation. Now it could have some impact on these contracts because most of the time the money is borrowed to do that. And that creates another problem, doesn't it? So. You know, I think Wall Street is just out of control. I think the central banks are out of control. I think the governments are out of control. I think this whole system is out of control and it has to be cleaned out. It has to be. Let's look a little bit more because these are the notional amount of derivative contracts that are in the system. And the top four banks, so you have JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, and Bank of America, the top four. Okay, here are their assets, which the four together total, what, this is, this is in terms of, okay, so over eight trillion in assets. And by the way, that includes your deposits. That's their asset because when you make a deposit, you loan them, them your money. So that's their asset. But look at the derivatives, a whole lot more leveraged bets, right? So just going to the top four, they have over 8 trillion in, uh, in assets, including your deposits, but almost, but over 173 trillion in leveraged bets. And those bets can go, when they blow up, that's bigger than anybody can bail out. JP Morgan, their assets to their derivative bets, 16.62 times, 98 for Goldman Sachs, almost 99, over 26 times for Citibank, and nine times, you know, Bank of America gets the gold medal because it's only just a little bit over nine times leverage. So I don't know how comfortable you feel with these numbers, but my goodness, an explosion like this could definitely take down the entire banking system. And while we're in the FDIC, well, these are the precious metals, i.e. gold contracts in the FDIC insured banks, because there was a little tweak and they had to claim their contracts a little more honestly. Do I think this is all of them? No, I do not but you can see how they manipulate and how easy and cheap it is to manipulate gold because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. Do they want you to know what I've shown you here today? No, they do not want you to know it because they want you to keep your wealth in their system because then frankly, it's kind of easy to bail in. But this, this, that's all counterparty risk. This runs zero counterparty risk, is, an, is a proven inflation hedge. So get this clear, your deposit is the bank's asset and deposits are still, even though they changed a lot of those post laws that were put in place, Dodd-Frank laws that were put in place after 2008, they've reversed almost all of them, but not the bail-in laws, which give the bank the right to bail in your funds in a failing bank. But don't worry because they're gonna give you shares of stock. 
They have no market value because who wants shares of stock in a failing institution? But hey, if that's what you want, then that's where you hold your wealth. And that's what you'll get. But they have hidden leverage that we're not being told about. We don't understand this. And it's so darn complicated and complex anyway. Your eyes glaze over and go, ah, forget it. They must know what they're doing. No, they don't know what they're doing. And that's the problem. It's the blind leading the blind. And the deadline is looming. Could they postpone it? Well, they've done it before, except now they've made it mandatory for all contracts to be written against the SOFA, no longer the LIBOR. So it'd be kind of hard to undo all of that. So the rest of this year is going to be really interesting. I think we're going to see a whole lot more volatility, you know, because we're coming into 2023. 2022 has indeed turned out to be a pivotal year. And the markets are happy because they think that the central banks are going to come back and do this when they're trying to save their dying systems. And they will. They will. I'm, I'm, I'm 100% convinced that they will. So maybe, you know, I mean, I've had people say, well, that doesn't look like too big of a difference. And, and maybe nothing will happen. Well, you know, I'll tell you what, I had a brother, a genius, absolutely genius. And he had a lab down in his basement where he would perform experiments. Some of those experiments turned out pretty interesting and, and okay. But some of them did not. And he almost lost his thumb. His, he, he had a scar. He's no longer with us, but he had a scar on his thumb from one of his experiments gone awry. Well, unfortunately, I think that a lot of people are going to lose a whole lot more than a thumb. I just don't want anybody to be in that position. So you need to share this. It's that important. And as you know, there's been lots of other work that's coming out. I will keep you in the loop on this. Make sure that you follow those links and take your time if you have to watch them once, twice, three times, even four times. And if you have questions, just let me know. Send them into questions at ITM Trading and let me try and explain it a little bit differently. I, I don't, I really don't want you to feel like, oh, well, if I ask a question, then she's going to think I'm dumb or I, th that's not really, that's not true, number one. Because if you don't understand what I've told you, then it's my job to figure out how to explain it in a way that you can get it. So please give us the opportunity. Or, you know, you can click that Calendly link below and you can have a conversation with our consultants. And if they can't answer your question, well, certainly they know how to get a hold of me. That's easy enough. But this is so, so important. Please don't ignore it. Give us an opportunity to help you understand it so that you can make choices that are educated and put your best interest first. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.